Stefan, uh, present yourself in, in that database that Nash, that everybody around the world knows. I think it's important that you precise a little bit how you work in those 150 countries. What I appreciate in your work is that you um, are a bit of counterbalance on the fashion weeks that are becoming really a little bit ridiculous and powerful. So please, um, if you can address this kind of topic for starting the discussion. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Linda, for having me. Um, Not Just a Label was created in 2008 uh, to give visibility to uh, every designer who has a great creative idea, who has a great uh, vision for design. And um, and and we wanted to provide a free free platform because, I mean, as you know, the fashion system, as it was functioning for the last 40, 50 years, meant that unless you spend money, you will not get the visibility that you need to be able to retail your designs and to be able to um, reach the customer. Uh, so the system was always built in a way that it, contradict or in some way it um, it hinders the designers from being able to reach the consumer who might be interested in purchasing their designs. So I think for the last 10 years, we've been working on cutting out the middleman uh, and creating a new system in fashion that connects the creators directly with the people they need to speak to and interact with. And I think we've achieved that by creating a platform that is free of cost for now close to 49,000 designers around the world. Um, we've been working with about 200 universities around the world, including Polymoda when you were there, um, to just allow everyone, um, and especially fashion graduates, to use not just the label a little bit, how people who go and study business would use LinkedIn. Um, so it's, a, it's basically your business card in the online world, then it allows you to do anything you want with it. Um, over the years, we we created many great projects to go beyond the digital platform. So we have created physical events in, in Italy, like the Origin Show in Vicenza, uh, but also huge uh, retail stores in Dubai, New York, Berlin, London, um, to basically show the consumer that there's an alternative to established brands, but also an alternative to fast fashion. And um, I think this year has been one for significant change, but also a significant growth for, or an opportunity for growth um, and, and, and re I, I would say almost like not reinventing the system, but I think with this year, the system has been forced to change. And, and we took the initiative and for the first time introduced the retail functionality to our site. Um, so we launched a marketplace where every designer, not just a label, now can sell directly to the consumer and they can completely bypass the fashion system as we know it. So um, the first three months, uh, it's been online since August, have been fantastic. Um, we have been seeing uh, incredibly interesting results that will change how fashion works. 40% of our products that designers sell are made to order. That means we're going away from ready to wear. Um, that means designers can wait for an order to come in and they then make or make that garment from scratch and ship it out. So uh, contrary to the sort of Amazonification of the world where everything needs to be delivered the next day, when somebody orders something they really want and that is made for them, they are really willing to wait up to 30 days for that product. Um, us as not just a label, we take the risk away from everyone because the consumer pays us. Um, we let the designer work on the garment, they ship it, and then the designer gets paid. Uh, we give also 70% of the retail price to the designers, which is huge. Um, if you would buy the same dress on that Porte, the designer would probably get about 8 to 10%. Um, so there's a huge increase in terms of profit margin uh, because the designers don't have to go to fashion weeks, as you mentioned, they don't have to go to trade shows, they don't have to go to, they don't need a PR agency, they don't need to send samples to an editor at Vogue magazine. Um, so it's 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 a complete democratization of fashion, but at the same time, you know, curation is still very important, and and we, as in not just a label, want to make sure that the site is always well curated, uh, because in the end, you know, the the average order on our not uh, on our website is about three hundred and fifty dollars, so we're still in a very high segment. Um, but I think this is the future. Um, you know, we're going away from designers overproducing. 
there. They can wait for orders to come in. Um, we have a new term that we call cut to order, which means the designer waits for the order and starts cutting material only when the order has come in. Uh, so designers are not sitting on boxes full of dresses in small, medium, and large and are waiting for, to ship them out. Uh, and we have uh, seen an exceptionally low return rate. So since August, we had less than 2% of returns. Um, if you compare that UX to net a porte the return rate is over 60% for those companies um, because people buy five dresses and send four back or even they send all five back. Uh, with us, people do not return the items simply because they know they're working directly with a maker. So yeah, it's, it's an innovative business model in fashion, but in a very embarrassing way for fashion. It's also a business model that existed 500 years ago when you went to a tailor and you had something made for you, you know, and, and um, it took that long for the fashion industry to change and, and hopefully we can build on that. Yeah, time was ready for change. I mean, we were actually doing things wrong and badly. And I'm, I'm afraid young designers are really enthusiastic about the change. They need uh they need uh, to be to have that freedom and 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 they don't feel uh, asphyxiated by the big houses buying companies and selling and and and, and actually ruining uh, the integrity of the of the fashion system so i think there is a lot of hope and i, I appreciate enormously what you do for those kids and and for those uh, designers um, I'm going to to Alessio. You are also um, taking care of heritage. You think that craftsmanship and heritage is important, but I think it's better that you talk about that yourself. Thank you, Linda. Yes, my 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 research is started from craftsmanship in a way because I founded this project ten years ago that is called artisanal intelligence AI that in a way is the opposite of artificial intelligence. And 10 years ago, this concept of artificial intelligence was not so strong right now. And uh, what is uh, artisanal intelligence is something that is uh, difficult to define, is that things that is very like, uh, you know, and there is in all like Italian manufacturing in a way. Uh, so my, my research starts from that to, in a way, to connect fashion with other like arts, like uh, visual arts, cinema. So I worked in this kind of a project uh, that were exhibit, but not only exhibit, a sort of a new model, uh, like, like a mood board, sort of big mood board in which there were heritage, uh, new designers uh, and uh, archives. And this was started in Rome because Rome is the place for that in a way, if we think like uh, the importance of the cinema and uh, we just finished an exhibit in Rome that was about the inspiration between uh, costume design and fashion and is the real, uh, you know, the uh, DNA that we have if we only we think to the designers that are started from here, like Alessandro Michele or like Maria Grazia Chiuri or Pierparo Piccioli, it's something that is very connected with the cinema heritage. So what I'm uh, talking about is that, that in this DNA that is in all, in all the posts, you know, in all the county, in all the, uh, every, different heritage in a way it's, it's a way to talk between people for this it started this project in tulum that was to connect uh, uh, the design in a way the contemporary design with the local community in which the the, the, the crafts are a way to express also spiritual and very deep message that, that they they received from nature uh, so something super important and sacred so this is for me is a very important and could be uh, a way to rethink uh, uh, future in a way and it's becoming um, a trend for every kind of brand to talk about crafts and craftsmanship but it's also uh, a way to 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 produce less and uh, to be more conscious and more like sustainable because artisanal production is sustainable in a way so also the new generation and uh, it's very important value for new generation in a way i think I, from what I see in the school and like a collaboration workshop that we did. I wanted to ask Stefan, um, you, you see a, lo a lot of kids from coming from school. Are they always at level? What do they miss? I know what they have, but what do they miss? If I would have given you one answer a year ago and 
and there's a different answer now with what is going on in the world. And I think there's probably no education in the world that can prepare you for what we're going through right now. So I think there are no rules. And, and I mean, are designers prepared? No. Um, but I think, I hope they, they find a moment of, of awakening where obviously the traditional fashion education uh, teaches you also the traditional fashion system, which includes you know, all the middlemen that we discussed from, you know, from trade shows to fashion weeks to distributors, showrooms, um, you know, uh, the fact that you have to uh, basically rent your collection to a store and they sell it for you and you get your money, you know, a year later. And all of these things that that were so prevalent in, in previous times, because in some way it was built uh, so that designers were uh, almost forced to sort of... Uh, you know, pay, pay their dues to be to be part of the fashion game and the fashion system. I think that is that is gone now. You know, and I think if 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 there's one thing that designers need to know right now is how to sell uh, fashion directly from their studio. Um, so I think that's one really important thing. And the other important thing I think is being flexible in how they operate their business. So I think the businesses that will continue to exist and grow next year are the businesses that can scale up really quickly, but they can also scale down really quickly. So I think as a business owner, you need to be flexible and flexible. and you need, yeah, you need to be able to, you know, let's say work from your home, but you need to be able to employ 10 people when you need it. But you also need to be able to run your business alone when things get really tough. And that's how I think you should continue building that business. I don't think there's any education that, that teaches you what, you know, even us as a business are going through right now because we're sitting at home and you know, and running the business from our from our kitchen tables. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, not just the label. In 2016, we took the decision to already build up a team that works around the world in a remote basis. So I've been working from home for the last two or three years because we were in London. We had about 30 employees in one big office, and the rent kept on going up. And and at some point, I realized that 50, 60 percent of our yearly costs are just overheads from having an office. Um, so the same thing applies to designers. I think the creativity is something they learn in school or they, you know, they get inspired elsewhere. So I think that's not what I'm concerned about. What I'm concerned about is how do you get digitally savvy? How do you do your photography properly? Um, you know, so many designers who are uploading products to our marketplace right now don't even have perfect descriptions. You know, how do you describe your dress in a way that somebody wants to buy it? Or how do you describe your dress so somebody understands if they need to get a medium or a large. Um, so these are all points that um, that designers need to start learning. In, in fact, it's a, it's another business model they have to learn. And yeah. uh, they, they are their own CEO and they have to be careful that they uh, produce locally. Do we produce more locally? Um, Alessio and, and Stefan, the same question. Yeah, I think that, yeah, it's becoming more interesting to be more uh, local, no? We are rediscovering uh, our production, our tradition in a way. For me, my point is like now the creative director is becoming someone that does only clothes, but does project with artists, with uh, everything. So what 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 uh, when I teach what I see that is really missing is the research. The research is becoming more flat. It's something very Instagram, so super flat. There is no any kind, very superficial in a way. So and what you know the difference is all all the brand the big brand does million of project right now, and in the past was not like that. So they do film, they do exhibit, they do collaboration with artists because there is all this material also to produce for online. So they need to be ready and they, it's, you know, everything started from a sort of knowledge that we are losing in a way in the school because sometimes are very technical and uh, the research is flat when you, when you see the mood board, when you see like, you know, it's hard to see something really new and interesting. It's something that is taken from Pinterest. It's something that is taken from Instagram. You see this image, you ask for what is that? And normally they don't they don't know what I I saw it on Instagram, I saw it on Pinterest. So since there is no story be, behind a research, behind an image that is taken for a collection. How can we resolve that, Stefan? 
difficult. Um, I mean, uh, you know, to your earlier questions, I think local production is necessary right now because, you know, when, when the lockdown started to happen around the world, there were those designers who, you know, were waiting for their shipping container from China to be offloaded at the port and, and you know, their factories yeah, were closed, you know, so I think they were, they were completely stifled in terms of how to run their business. And then there are other designers who manufacture locally and, and their business is doing really well. So I think that's amazing that production is coming back into a regional, you know, local or regional environment. In terms of inspiration, I mean, I have to agree with Alessio. It's uh, you know, social media is 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 the enemy to the world right now, you know, and and um, it it's really really hard, you know, and and I think the hardest part is that social media is such a low, it's the lowest hanging fruit in terms of technology, you know. There's so much interesting technology out there, um, but you know, the fact that we in fashion. Unfortunately, we always sort of are pretty happy with, you know, something that is quite average, you know, and, and Instagram is now the biggest tool that people use in fashion to be inspired, but also to to inspire others, you know, and, and, and yeah, that's an issue. I, I, I read a really interesting quote and it said, the guru does not sit on a mountain and says, have you seen my Instagram account? And, <laughs> and, and I think that really applies to that, you know. Uh, <laughs> I think we need to um, bring together now the, the the digital and the physical to make both more interesting because separated yeah. they are a little bit poor for the moment. If we can yeah. overlap the digital and the and also become more curator because curating is a word that's a bit uh, used and overused, but uh, yeah. especially in 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 fashion and in art. But I think if, if a designer learns to curate a dress and tell the story and make it more beautiful by um, producing a, a kind of interesting imagery, uh, we, we make a step forward. What do you think, Stefan? No, I, I fully agree. You know, I think it's just hard at the moment to sort of, you know, say we should all be more inspired because, I mean, you know, it, it's hard, you know, I mean, I see it yeah. even with myself and my girlfriend, you know, we, the first four or five months of the pandemic for us were great because, you know, being in California and having nice weather and, and endless nature out here, you know, we, we completely fell in love with nature again and we were out there and we were inspired, but, you know, and now that it's autumn and it's getting colder and, you know, and I'm sure in Europe it's even worse, you know, it's just, you're, you're stuck, you know, and, and at some point you just stop dressing up, you know, you start wearing sweatpants, you start yeah. wearing booty. Sometimes you don't even get dressed anymore. So, you know, I have days where I'm not even inspired by my own life, you know, and, 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 and I'm looking at this screen every day for 10 hours, you know, and, and it, it's just hard. But I think, I think what is more interesting is perhaps there's something that we will find that, you know, in 20 years from now, we will look back at, you know, the era of the pandemic, you know, and, and there's a really interesting type of fashion that came out. I hope it's more than, than the hoodie, but um, we'll see. Um, although the hoodie at the moment is the most sold item in fashion globally. <laughs> Alessio, do you believe that smaller cities can again uh, bring interesting designers? I do a, a project in Italy that is about the migrant trend. So the trend created by migrant refugees that are in Italy, so we develop that we help to them to develop their dreams to study fashion, uh, to have their tailoring, and we see what how interesting is their approach to fashion. We really need them, you know, because it's something super, super wonderful new energy in fashion, new ideas, and really a new subculture. How they mix, like you know, uh, the fake, uh, uh, you know. Um, because they have some 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 trends, so they love to have like a sort of uh, elements of wax mixed with street culture. So we did a lot of workshop together with the museum in Rome. It was super interesting. So for me, absolutely, we we need like a new new new. new thing. I think the big city are like a little bit, uh, you know. Uh, strange and where the, the city that are dominated by business uh, is becoming more and more difficult to find something interesting and something new. Where do you find the best uh, design, Stefan? In what kind of 
zone in in the world what what uh, is well, what, yeah yeah I, i mean for us you know we've always been saying that fashion comes from more than just four fashion capitals and and our website is a testament to that i mean there's designers from 150 countries and we have 300 new designers joining every month and they come from from five continents you know so the 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 city of origin for us doesn't really matter because it's just we see creativity Uh, being fantastic all around the world. Um, what is happening now, though, is interesting because about two or three years ago, especially with Brexit, but also with um, you know the cost of living being so high in cities like New York and London, yes. those two cities they lost about 34 percent of their young creative population. So people between 25 and 35 years old left those cities, and and we know where they went. They went to Berlin, to Barcelona, to Rome. Uh, to Warsaw in the U.S., they went to Nashville, to Bozeman, and, and, and these are really interesting really up-and-coming cities. Um, what actually just happened, which is funny, uh, just an hour ago, I was actually speaking on a panel for um, for the region of Alto Adige, where I'm from, and and they're working now on some sort of way of recognizing their own creative economy, and and I think they're very early in realizing that there's a regional power now, you know, there's no reason to be in these big cities anymore and paying, you know, thousands of euros yeah. or dollars in rent. Um, and, and I always said, you know, if creatives are not allowed to make mistakes then the society doesn't benefit because we need to put creatives in a place where they can experiment, research, they can make mistakes over and over again to then finally, you know, come up with something that, is finally ready, but it needs to be ready when they want and not when, you know, they need to sell it because they need to pay next month's rent. Um, so I think it's interesting what's happening and, and you know, there's no reason for people to live in, in these big cities anymore. And it's great that it's coming back, that people can go to smaller towns and, and they can use the regional resources they have there, which, which are fantastic. Um, so we'll see what's happening. I believe in those neighborhoods and, and, and new energy in smaller cities. But um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to that new uh, way that uh, young people will connect. And they, feel, they think that, that the system is old and they don't need the system. They, uh, Stefan, you were there the first to prove it, but uh, there is a lot of job work to do, I guess. Yeah, I think, I think on, a, on a, let's say, the... The, the playing field is getting more level. So I think what is great is that if designers are, are digitally savvy and they can use the internet the right way, then there is no boundaries. They can become very big very quickly. Uh, but I think, you know, there's a lot that, you know, politics and, and infrastructure can do. I mean, it, it's really interesting because, you know, I've, I've not been living in Italy for a long time, but I was just told that the profession of an artist is not even recognized in Italy. So that's what those politicians were just saying in the panel that I was on. And I was shocked. So there's no partita IVA for, no. for artists, which is crazy. You know, it's, it's like the birthplace yeah, of art and, yeah. and it's not recognized. So I think these are things that need to change. And then hopefully, you know, the good thing is, You know, if you look at how many, how many, how much support, you know, agriculture gets, you know, if you have to buy a machine for, for operating your fields and that costs 500,000 euros, then there's a way to finance that through the government. But, you know, if a photographer needs to buy a camera for 20,000 and there's nothing, but I think the return on investment is huge now. So I think if there's cities like Antwerp, like, um, you know, Nashville in the music industry and so on, if there's small hubs that can now act and just say, We have a building. Let's fill it with artists. Let's make, you know, no rent, you know, and let's reduce the taxes for those people and, and help them. Then mm. there's a huge potential as well. There are so many shops empty in every city. We can yeah. use them. Alessio, mm. in Rome. Yeah. I, mean, I guess yeah, yeah. many Rome. are also in Florence yeah, yeah. And, and I see it all um, over. What Stefan does is great because I've worked uh, a lot also with Alta Roma and it's a comp competition that uh, happens in Rome with young. Uh, the real, real problem is to create their own business because, you know, communication, publication, everything is great. But the real point is how can you build your business? And nobody knows. And in Italy, there is a big problem around that because there is no one new brand really or very, very few. 
and um, there were so many competition importance, so many designers that, 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 that were helped from the, the, the camera mode in Milan, but no one has a real business. And what, what Stefan does is great to, to give the opportunity to develop, uh, to have like a window with, with, with their, so yes. And but I think for me in the future, there will be, a, the store will be a sort of archive in a way, which in which you can see and then you order uh, online. So also the store, it's a big issue to discuss about because I don't know if, if in the future there will be the store. You know, it's something that will be an experience, will be, you know, something like, like an archive for me. Yeah, we can we can squat the, the shops in New York and do something great, I believe. So. Yeah, I mean, come on, let's be the revolutionary and, and break the rules and go in the, the all those uh, shops who are empty and, and, and have no content. And also no content uh, philosophically wise, there is not really a reason why you should buy for the moment, not optimistic, positive, uh, that uh, we are creating a new energy for the moment. Uh, we are tired, there is a kind of tiredness, but I feel there is also a kind of optimism and especially in smaller cities. Yeah, I think it's like uh, it's uh, there is like an opportunity to 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 rebuild a system that is uh, is finished in a way in the, with with the same uh, you know the same ways the same uh, uh, will, the, there will be something new for sure. So let's uh, finish on this survival positive note, <laughs> and <laughs> and I thank you both for this uh, interesting conversation. Thank you, Stefan, for all the work you, you do for young designers. We appreciate and keep on uh, keep on doing this, and uh, because we need you. Huh? Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alex. Thanks so much, Linda, thank you. and thank good you. meeting thank you. you.